Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Omar Figueroa, and um, this is going to be our legal panel. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and then quickly about our illustrious colleagues. And then we're going to um, have a legal overview uh, of the California laws and regulations pertaining to cannabis drinks. We're also going to talk about how the market is shaped by the laws and the regulations. And then we're also going to have a discussion about hemp and CBD drinks. Finally, we're going to talk about investment trends and end up with research and development. Uh, so I guess I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Omar Figueroa. I've been a lawyer doing cannabis law for 20 years now. I, I went to Stanford Law School and Yale College and recently attended the Wharton School uh, for uh, Corporate Directors. And um, my interest in cannabis law started when I was um, in law school, and we had all sorts of um, kind of boring speakers at Stanford Law School, Supreme Court justices, corporate barons, whatever. But the most interesting person who came to speak was actually a hippie lawyer named Tony Serra. And he was uh, profiled in the Stanford Alumni Magazine as a cannabis advocate. And when he came to Stanford, he really was on fire. And th to me, that was like the most exciting type of law to practice with somebody as engaged and interested in his subject matter as Tony Serra. So I started working with him. Um, I focused on defending cannabis growers. Uh, to me, th those were super interesting people, nonviolent, peaceful, um, but with a long-term mindset. And I've defended hundreds of cannabis growers all across California over the years. Um, I've also written three books now on the California cannabis laws and regulations, and also um, I'm a director of the International Cannabis Bar Association and have founded a firm that focuses on regulatory compliance as well as um, intellectual property. So I'm gonna start by introducing Michael Hayford, who's to my left, and um, we're gonna kind of gloss over these fantastic um, introductions just so we can get more into the meat. So Michael is a serial entrepreneur and business development professional with 25 years of experience in sales, business developments, and management. Um, he uh, works with Lighthouse Strategies in San Diego and over the course of his career, he uh, has held sales, operations, management, and executive management positions for both public and private companies with annual revenues ranging from $10 million to $150 million. Um, Hayford's extensive business development expertise um, delivers compounding growth to local, regional, and national markets. And uh, right now, he has some very interesting uh, ventures that he is working on, and he will be able to elaborate on those when he's answering the questions. Thanks. Next, we have uh, Lauren Mendelson, and Lauren Mendelson is an associate at um, the law offices. We work together. She's my colleague, and she is uh, one of the brightest young lawyers in the cannabis space. Um, she focuses on permitting, licensing, regulatory compliance, and she's also, in, in my opinion, one of the best application writers in California. If you need your application granted, go to Lauren and, you know, to maximize the chances of that happening. Uh, for the past few years, she has also been active in drug policy reform. Uh, Lauren is on the board of the Sonoma County Growers Alliance, and she was formerly the chair of the board of directors of an international organization, Students for, for Sensible Drug Policy. Um, Lauren got her JD from the University of California at Irvine, and her BS in psychology from the University of Maryland. Um, she is very passionate about the environment, human and civil rights, science, and the arts, and we're lucky to have her with us. Thank you. And then Stacy um, Hostetter also used to work at the law offices until she became general counsel of Canacraft. And Canacraft is the largest vertically integrated cannabis company in the state of California. Uh, prior to her work in the cannabis industry, Stacy worked with craft breweries and distillers as outsourced in-house counsel, and she did all sorts of matters ranging from regulatory compliance to intellectual property. 
She is also the co-author of Brew Law 101, a legal guide to opening a brewery. And uh, you know, that, that's kind of like a mainstay in the brewing world for California brewers. Um, Stacy graduated from the University of San Diego School of Law and she passed the state bar in 2015. During law school, she was editor-in-chief for the uh, law newspaper and uh, she was the lead articles editor for the International Law Journal. Um, she graduated magna cum laude with honors from the University of Redland and um, she has a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature and she is an excellent writer. And so, Thank you, Omar. Yes, so now we're gonna get started and I guess uh, we're gonna start off with a, kind of like a legal overview. So um, maybe Lauren, can you give us an overview of California laws and regulations governing cannabis drinks? Sure, well first, thank you everyone for being here today. It's the last session of the day. I know it's been a long one, but we will try our best to keep this a lively discussion and we will save some time for questions at the end, so just hold on to them if you have them. Um, when it comes to cannabis drinks here in California, um, if we're talking about drinks that are derived from a cannabis plant, um, whether they contain THC or just CBD, something that's going to end up in a dispensary, there are lots of rules and regulations that are now in place uh, governing these types of products with regards to dosage, with regards to packaging and labeling. Um, and these regulations, for the most part, were put forth by the California Department of Public Health. There are also some regulations that are relevant from the Bureau of Cannabis Control. And we're talking about cannabis uh, drinks that people are buying at dispensaries. Um, there are limitations such as uh, the amount of THC that can be in these products, right? So edible products as a category of cannabis products are capped at 100 milligrams of THC per package. Um, and they also have uh, serving dose limitations, specifically no more than 10 milligrams of THC per serving. The state doesn't really care right now how much CBD is in these products. Um, they're concerned uh, with the amount of THC as what they're considering psychoactive. Now, you guys have heard some science talks today, and, and honestly, psychoactive is not really the right terminology to use here. Both THC and CBD are psychoactive in different ways, um, but that's just kind of you know, the terminology that folks will use. So we've got those dosage limitations. We've got the package limit limitation. Um, there's also lots of rules about um, how these products can be packaged. They have to be in child-resistant packaging. And if it's a type of edible or drinkable cannabis product that has more than one serving, it's got to be child-resistant for the entire life of the product, meaning you can open it up once, put the top on, and it's still child-resistant. It maintains that um, so that if a young child were to pick it up and it's already been opened once, it would still be difficult for them to get into that product. Um, so, you know, those are some of the rules. There is a lot that needs to be printed on the label. And oftentimes we're talking about products that are, you're limited in the amount of space you have on the bottle or the package. And so there's a lot you've got to fit on there. There are ways to get around that via supplemental labeling, like a pullback tab or a hang tag that has some additional information on it. Um, but you really want to be reading these rules very carefully if you're making products that are going to end up in a licensed dispensary to make sure that you've got all of the information on there that you need. Need. And the state is specific as to you know which side of the label you're putting things on and how big the font is. All of that is regulated. Um, so you know that's when we're talking about uh, cannabis drinks and dispensaries. Now, something that you guys have also been talking a lot about at this expo is probably just hemp and CBD drinks, and that's kind of a whole other category of things. If it's not coming from a licensed cannabis producer here in California. Licensed dispensaries are only allowed to sell cannabis goods. So a dispensary actually cannot sell a product, uh, they can't sell you a soda or you know, a, a bag of chips. They can only sell cannabis products at this time. They can't even sell hemp products unless they were derived from a cannabis producer. Um, and it's interesting, cannabis edibles in California are not considered food or drinks. They're just their own thing. Um, and so there are efforts to change this, and, and I think we're going to go into this a little bit in the future, to allow dispensaries um, to be able to sell these hemp and CBD products now that there's changes at the federal level with regards to these regulations. Um, so hopefully that's something that's coming. And then um, in terms of what can be sold outside of the dispensary, I mean, that's, that's a whole, something else we're probably going to go into later in the discussion. So. Okay. 
Now, Stacy, could you um, elaborate a little bit on the um, regulations governing maybe marketing of cannabis products? And yeah, so marketing is a really interesting area for, for beverages. There's, there's, there's a lot of traditional rules that you probably w would not be surprised to see. The big thing is, uh, you know, the first one that always comes to mind for me is not appealing to children. And that's a wonderful sentiment. I think we all can kind of agree that, you know, for the most part, we're not trying to, to market to children. But what does it mean to market to children? What, what do children like? Do they like bright colors? They, do they like, uh, well, so do adults. That's it's one of those things. So we're, there are a lot of rules right now that are relatively subjective and maybe even arbitrary in a lot of ways. Um, but you, you definitely need to be very careful. And, and certainly, we would recommend consult le legal counsel with regards to making sure that you're walking those fine lines as much as possible. You can also always work with the regulators. So if you have a question, you know the regulators um, are generally happy to talk to you and come to some reasonable, what they consider to be reasonable accommodations where they can be made. But there's definitely a lot of rules around uh, colors. And this is true in California, but this is true in, in other states as well. So to the extent that you're thinking of a scalable packaging, that's really difficult to pull off right now. Uh, something that would work in California may not be compliant when you get to, say, Washington. You know, one of the things is Washington State has some, some very stringent color uh, requirements that you wouldn't have to deal with when it comes to California. And that's a lot about, you know, whether or not you're marketing to children. There's also restrictions, certainly in California, about cartoon characters and things of that nature. Um, edibles that would be seen as something that are like in the shape of an insect, an insect, sorry, or a human, things of that nature. All of these things that, when consumers see them, might reasonably mistake them for being a, a non-cannabis version of itself. So there's a lot of things that go into that. There's also a lot of rules about not pretending to be a different kind of product. And so you see a lot of these, certainly in the beverage category, about alcohol. Uh, our company has a really great beverage product called Hi-Fi Hops that we make in collaboration with Lagunitas Brewing Company. And we had to go through quite a few hurdles to figure out how to market it appropriately because Lagunitas Brewing Company is a beer company, shock and awe, and you want to make sure that you're not implying to people that the product itself is a beer. It's not a beer. It was never a beer. It's not meant to be a beer. It's beer adjacent in a lot of ways, as we like to think of it. But there was a lot of marketing restrictions that we had to walk a fine line with on that regard to make sure that we're, we're really honestly portraying the product the way it's meant to be. Product. Right. And then if I can just jump in real quick, it is against the law here in California to have uh, a cannabis beverage be an alcoholic beverage. So you can't have an alcoholic weed drink. Um, there are exceptions, there are certain tinctures where alcohol might be an ingredient in the actual tincture, but it's not an alcoholic beverage in the sense of having a drink. Um, and so that's still something that's not allowed at this time, mainly just because of the effect. We're, we don't know enough about the effect of combining alcohol and cannabis on the body. Um, I think in the future that is something that might be allowed. Um, but at this time, it's, it's not permitted under the California regs. As attorneys, how do you guys look at the guidance from cannabis control where it's in conflict with the California business code, right? So where, uh, interesting, <laughs> our product, one of our products is, is is uh, Two Roots Brewing. Um, so we went through the same thing Lagunitas went through with very strict changes. Couldn't call it a non-alcoholic beer. You can say it's non-alcoholic, non -alcoholic, can't call it beer. Can't say what style it was, it was brewed from, which then now you're marketing it as a beverage, but not as a beer or a style of beer or a flavor of beer, which then means you're marketing it as something other than it is, which is a violation of another section of the California Business Code. So it's really interesting as you get into this is there's interpretation. And, and that's, the most, that's the most challenging part in the cannabis so, market is really regulator interpretations of what legislators wanted to have happen. Mm -hmm. And it goes in the hands of human beings. And then it gets interpreted. And then you're stuck between two different codes. And now you're violating one because one, one section of the government said do this. The joys of a new industry, <laughs> making it up as we go along. And I think, what was the term that was settled upon? Non-alcoholic craft beverage? You can't, uh, well, we couldn't say craft. You couldn't say non-alcoholic. Non-alcoholic, you can't say beer. Uh, you can't name uh, the ingredient uh, a hop, except for in the ingredient panel. So even the descriptors, we, we had to remove the word traditional, or the phrase traditional German beverage, because that might be misleading. So very different state to state, where in Nevada, Nevada was completely comfortable with all those references, and whether it said brewing company, or craft, or German beverage, uh, so it's just very different state to state and understanding how those laws interrelate and then where you end up in the end.
Absolutely, and it just shows how, at least for the near future, you're probably going to need to have slightly different packaging and, lab and what's on the label, and, and depending on what states your products are in. Uh, very true. The, the best thing you can do is find, the, uh, from a package perspective, one that's going to survive as many states as possible, and then realize that uh, when you choose your labeling approach, you've got to choose the most flexible labeling approach, because laws change regularly and frequently, uh, or often, um, and you know, Nevada says Brewing Co. is okay. California says no. So now I've got a different label. So as a manufacturer, have, how have you had to adapt your product offerings uh, based on the legal and regulatory constraints? Like, you know, you're, you're saying like in Nevada, you're able to market non-alcoholic beers containing cannabis, and that's completely kosher. In California, you can't say non-alcoholic and beer with cannabis at the same time. Yeah, 100%. We had to, you, you've got different packaging. Now you've got different websites because you can't say this in California, but you can say this in Nevada. And so if you were, if you started your product in Nevada and brewing's okay and talking about the styles, origin, everything of the products, that's great. Well, California said, please create another website. Please create new packaging. And so it's, it's interesting where the federal government on the side of alcohol in a liquor store where there's predominantly alcoholic beverages, the only thing that protects a consumer from a non-alcoholic beer or wine from the rest is just the word non-alcoholic on the package, that little thing. Um, in California, we're taking it a very, very far to the left on the interpretation of don't mislead consumers that this is an alcoholic beverage. And non-alcoholic is not enough to protect consumers in a store that's licensed to sell nothing but cannabis products. <laughs> Ironically, we, yes. I, I, can, I can attest to that as well. I mean, it, it's a really frequent thing where you say, but, but a reasonable person reading this says non-alcoholic. You kind of think it's not alcoholic. Um, and we've run, we've run into similar questions. And, and really finding a way to work with regulators is, is about, you know, how are we trying to protect reasonable consumers here? You can't, you can't protect everyone to the extent that, you know, if you can't understand the word non-alcoholic, who, who are we talking? Is that really a reasonable consumer? Well, is it reasonable that a consumer walks into a store that's licensed to sell anything? Only, the only thing it can sell is a cannabis product of some form. And I have to protect them in that store from thinking they're buying something with alcoholic, alcohol in it. That's you're beyond reasonable, uh, but they make the rules and we have to comply and you go through, you have to. And you, know, you can always suggest rule changes and I think you know, that's what's gonna start happening. Mm -hmm. There's also like challenges to underground regulations. Um, that we we have submitted ourselves a challenge recently. Um, you know, Stacy, um, what are some common missteps you see in beverage products? Like, you know, that was a question you suggested, which is excellent. Yeah, there, I mean, there's there's a lot of them, and they they apply to to other product categories as well. But I, I've seen it on beverages in a lot of really fun ways. And, and the first one that always comes to mind for me is health claims. And it's another one of those things where we're trying to protect reasonable consumers. There is a lot of information out there right now. And, and people want information. They want to educate themselves about these new products and the kind of benefits that they may or may not have. But at, in the current state of the United States, controlled, you know, controlled substances can't be tested, certainly not Schedule One can't be tested in a way that's really feasible for the levels that when you go to the cannabis regulations, they say you can make claims about your, your products as long as you have this really, really high level of scientific substantiation. By the way, that level of scientific substantiation doesn't exist yet in the United States because it's still a federally controlled Schedule One substance. And so I see a lot of people who get uh, really excited about the benefits, and especially you know the first thing they say, but it's, it's medical marijuana. It was medical marijuana. We want to make all these medical claims. And it's it's, you know, things change so quickly and you need to be really careful to stay on top of that. And it's not just about, you know, making claims that may be a little bit off or a little bit on. You know, it's more about, just in our opinion, really being transparent with your consumer. There is a lot of information out there. There's a lot of potential in these plants, but you want to be really careful about saying this will, you know, fix this condition for you. Or, you know, if you suffer from such and such, try this. It's going to make you feel great. Um, you want to be really careful that people really are seeking out medical advice when they want to. So that's one of the really biggest uh, missteps I feel like I've been seeing in beverages lately. But I think there's a lot to be said as well for, for people get really excited about beverages because it's such an exciting form factor. Um, people are used to beverages. It's easy. It's social. It's really easy for people to kind of migrate in with a beverage in, in the way that maybe they'd be a little bit more... Um, 
uh, nervous of an inhalable or, or something of that nature. But when you, when you start going down that path, you need to make sure that they're aware of things like, oh, well, you could have three or four beers in a sitting, but maybe you don't start with three or four of these beverages. Make sure you're understanding the doses that are in here and being really, really careful about how you communicate that um, with, with your consumer base. And if I could just jump in with regards to the health claims thing, that's a really great, really important point um, because we're getting into um, FDA talk right now. So the uh, Food and Drug Administration at the United States Food and Drug Administration recently held a hearing on uh, cannabis products and CBD and THC and all this because they see that this the CBD industry is booming across, and the, the hemp industry is just booming across the country, across the world. Um, and currently there are not a lot of rules and regulations in place for the types of products that you guys see at the at the gas station, or rather the rules are not being enforced. Um, so, But FDA is, is working on, and they should hopefully have some rules in place by later this summer or this fall, I was reading. Um, but one of the, the biggies, a big no-no, is making these health claims on any, any cannabis product, hemp product, because THC and CBD have not been approved as a drug by the FDA. They're not approved as a dietary supplement. They're not approved as a food well, additive. Technically, epidiolex. <laughs> but yes, that's a uh, FDA-approved versions, so so um, Marinol, Epidiolex, there are a few that have been FDA-approved, but if you're not that pharmaceutical formulation, it hasn't been FDA-approved, and you do need to be careful. And what the FDA has been doing, I've been reading their warning letters, they're going to people's websites, and even if you're not saying, this product may help you with this, they have even cracked down on folks who've been saying, CBD has been uh, shown to be helpful for this. Incredibly general claims, not even about their product, but just making claims now about THC or CBD and the FDA is, is citing those on these letters that they're sending to these companies as an argument that they are claiming their product is going to cure someone. So they are now making this leap that you have to, um, so you do have to be really careful. And it's kind of silly because there are lots of, there are more and more scientific evidence that's coming out about the medical benefits of all these different cannabinoids, about these terpenes and whatnot, but not in the FDA's mind if it hasn't been approved by them as, as one of their pharmaceutical drugs. So again, definitely um, speak with uh, legal counsel before you do any of this because um, there are lots of little ins and outs that you need to be aware of. That's a really great segue to a, a very similar misstep is people all the time are saying, oh, well, the dietary supplement organization or industry, they make these kinds of claims or they market their products in this way or that way. Um, I'm not trying to be a pharmaceutical company. I, I think of myself as a dietary supplement. And so I'm going to go into, into that, those kinds of different comparable companies and I'll mimic what they do. And that's how I'll walk that line between not having to read all of the FDA's guidance, which is just mountains and mountains and mountains of information. But because because there have been FDA approved pharmaceutical level epidiolics and there's, there's I think one other that I forget the name of every time, uh, you no longer can just fall into the dietary supplement realm. You, you're automatically, all of these CBD and THC products are gonna be bootstrapped up to this pharmaceutical grade. So you can't really pretend to be a dietary supplement anymore because, because of epidiolex. We're already bootstrapped up to that next level. So you can't use those companies as a, as a comp for all of your marketing materials in a way that I, I think people, people do a lot because it seems so intuitive to them. Mm -hmm. Well, I think outside of claims, when you're looking at beverages today, uh, what's important is to, from a product quality perspective is understanding how they're being made. Um, early <laughs> products in our market, and I think if uh, anybody that's been in the, in the industry for a while notice that you see a lot of really sugary uh, beverages out there because sugar is uh, very assist it's an assistant in an emulsion and helps stabilize the beverage and so that it can last longer uh, but now you're talking about a high sugar product generally very high milligrams um, and then you're looking at in emulsion technologies that aren't very stable um, and those can break down on time so if a product's on the shelf a little bit longer uh, it will the oils will recoagulate you break open your your nice beverage and gloop, you have a nice big gloop, um, uh, mouthful of of oils and you have a, a not a very good experience with that product and so there's other things that have to be careful about if you're looking at producing a beverage or buying a beverage is that oils are attracted to plastics um, as, as, as was discovered uh, by multiple uh, beverage companies like us and 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 uh, Lagunitas with uh, the liner of cans um, plastic bottles uh, so understand a lot of the, the really kind of the technical elements of the stability of, of is it healthy and will my my product be safe excellent um, I, I guess that kind of um, takes us to hemp and CBD drinks because like, you know, we have the cannabis drinks that are sold in dispensaries and it's highly regulated. And then we have all sorts of 
hemp derived CBD products that are available at gas stations and grocery stores and all sorts of unlicensed retailers. Um, and I guess my question is, you know, what, how are hemp and CBD drinks specifically regulated under federal law after the passage of the Farm Bill? Like, do you want to take a crack at it, Lauren? Sure. So, I mean, as I mentioned, this, the FDA is still working on a better way to regulate all of this. Um, back in December of 2018, um, the 2018 Farm Bill passed, which was a um, federal big bill that had lots of stuff in it, one of which had to do with industrial hemp. And what it did was it uh, redefined what industrial hemp is and removed that from the Controlled Substances Act. So the new definition of industrial hemp is basically any part of the cannabis plant with 0.3% um, THC or less, um, and uh, that's pretty much it. And that is no longer considered a controlled substance. Uh, previously, industrial hemp was defined by what type of the cannabis plant it was from. So it could be the stalk and the seeds that couldn't germinate, basically the not fun parts. Um, that was the old definition. But the new definition is basically, no, as long as it's less than 0.3% THC, um, or less than or equal to, I believe, then it's, uh, it's not considered cannabis anymore. It's now considered hemp. And um, there are the ideas for states or uh, native American tribes to create industrial hemp programs that then get approved by the federal government that will allow folks in those states to grow as part of their license system. Now, some states have had these programs going for a few year now, years now, Colorado, Kentucky, I believe Oregon. Um, so they've already had state uh, programs for industrial hemp up and running where folks have already been registered at their state level to participate in industrial hemp cultivation. And in certain states, I believe Colorado has hemp manufacturing uh, licenses that you can get. Um, in California, our industrial hemp program just got rolling here in the past couple months. Um, people just had the ability to sign up at their counties. Um, I think that happened in April or May or something like that. And so now some people throughout the state are applying to grow industrial hemp um, legally at the state level. Um, the state doesn't currently have any real rules for or licenses for manufacturing with hemp products or distributing. Um, and uh, But if you are going to be making these hemp-based products, you obviously want to make sure that you are getting it from a source that has a license and that it doesn't have any more than 0.3% THC, otherwise it's not hemp anymore, it's cannabis. Um, in terms of testing, there really aren't testing rules in place yet, which is, I think, really bad, and that's one of the things that both the state and the federal government are working on, having at least some type of safety testing in place, other than currently you do need to make sure that it's less than that level of THC, but there's no contaminant testing, and there's no testing for other things that might be present, which when you think about it is really dangerous. Anyone can just go into 7-Eleven and buy this untested product, and oftentimes these are sick people that think that they've heard about CBD as, as a cure-all, and now they're taking this untested product that is from some unlicensed stores, and it's pretty scary. Um, so we, I, I think we will start to see more rules and regs in terms of testing um, go into place there, but you're right, in terms of if you just want to manufacture these products right now in California, there really aren't too many rules in place, and there is a bill going through the state legislature right now. What's the number of that bill? AB 228. Yeah, 228, um, and I believe there's a hearing scheduled in a few weeks, um, and then it's almost passed. It already passed through one house, and then it's yes. almost done. It I mean, made it out of the assembly, and it's set for a second hearing before the Appropriations Committee of the Senate on August 12th. So Great, and that would, do, that would do a lot of things. I mean, it would give um, licensed dispensaries the ability to sell these hemp products, and it would also create some rules for people who wanted to manufacture hemp products. It would put some testing rules in place, so it would solve um, a lot of these problems that are, that are popping up right now without being too, um, too onerous, I think, the way it looks right now. So. And if you want to be responsible and you're making a CBD or a hemp-derived uh, beverage in this particular case, um, be responsible and go find a lab identify some standards to get it tested by, establish uh, responsible management um, of the products you're manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It'll cost a little bit, but in the end, you'll be ahead of the curve. Absolutely. So um, are hemp and CBD, you know, are just manufacturers in general, like anticipating this AB228 and maybe starting to develop potential product offerings? Um, well, gosh, there's there's so many product offerings out there now. Uh -huh. um, uh, 228 will just make that easier. Um, I think it's in the very in the most conservative approach would be 
uh, if you want to enter the CBD market, uh, you should be doing your product development and research, preparing if you want to be super comp uh, conservative, wait for for 228 to pass. Um, as we can see with uh, some of the largest uh, cannabis companies in the world, uh, as well as CBD companies, that they're not waiting. They're moving into the market now. Uh, they want to get ahead of it. And I think uh, there's some solid logic there because uh, you want to move quickly. But it's only going to make it easier. It's going to make it cleaner. It's going to make it more understood of how to do it and how to do it responsibly. But it's already happening. Products are everywhere. And it's, it's really important to remember where you're doing these activities. I think that's another really fun thing is we took, it's one plant, right? And we're talking about, oh, well, this is a really strong plant. This is a not so strong plant for this one little piece of it. And, and the companies that are mostly interested in it for the most, right now, seem to be cannabis companies. But those cannabis licenses that you went and got from the state of California and took a lot of effort and money and time and stress, they're for cannabis processing. Well, if hemp is no longer cannabis, that's, that's a different facility. So you need to be really careful about keeping an eye on where you do your various activities and making sure they're, they're done in a compliant space. Does that mean that um, a company that wants to have two product lines, one which is cannabis, and those are regulated, sold at dispensaries, another product line which is not sold at dispensaries, not highly regulated, you know, just under this AB228 or maybe under uh, go for it interpretation of the current enforcement posture, um, you know, I guess it, it seems like you know um, a company that that's doing that would probably like, you know would eventually there be two different markets, one that is super regulated for cannabis and one that is like almost laissez-faire for CBD drinks. And I guess, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, by law, you can't manufacture in the same facility. Nevada did the same thing, and, and you had to stop doing that in those facilities, and you have to uh, look for separate uh, environments to manufacture those goods. I think when you start looking at CBD, though, um, the question is, is, is it going to be a cottage business or is it going to be something more substantial? Because if in, in the case of beverages and you want to produce beverages to service the state of California or the United States, those facilities are significantly different than the cannabis manufacturing facilities you'll see today. So it's a different infrastructure depending on what you want to accomplish. And that's a great point, too. And I think at least for the near future, right, your, your cannabis sales are limited to within the state. Um, and but, but now you have the potential for international, interstate sales with these CBD products. So you're right, the scale of the facilities is probably going to look a little bit different, at least for right now. All right, let's um, switch gears and talk about investment trends. Um, I guess, you know, what are some investment trends that you've seen with regards to cannabis drinks? Well, gosh, I mean, everybody has seen what's going on with uh, with Constellation, obviously with Canopy. Um, you know, Canopy's now, you know, has a contingent offer to acquire or a deal to acquire acreage, which is now market accessibility for uh, Canopy and, you know, presumably a very robust uh, beverage platform. Um, the, there's a lot of uh, money today going into, especially publicly traded companies uh, that are even mentioning CBD uh, beverages. Um, but... I think I'd quote something from uh, Boris Jordan, the chairman of Cureleaf recently, where he was asked um, on the M&A and, and uh, the investment side of beverages or, or of, uh, of MSOs, multi-state operators in the country, is what's going to happen going forward. And, and his position was uh, consumer packaged goods. And so I think we're going to see a lot of activity now that there's been some consolidation at the MSO level um, where those, those, those large operators uh, actually need brands. Uh, they need products. They need consumer packaged goods. And I think that uh, beverages are going to play a big role in that. Um, there's too much money coming into the industry. If we look at you know, Moose, Mooseheads in, Molson Coors is in, uh, Anheuser-Busch in, Bev's in, Constellation's in, who's going to be in next? And it's going to drive a lot of interest in the sector, and it's going to drive a lot of change in the industry. So pretty much, um, pretty soon it's going to be a question of who's not in because everybody else will be in. Um, so in, Stacey, in terms of moving boundaries, what types of legal implications arise when looking to expand into new jurisdictions? Oh, there's, I mean, there's, there's obviously uh, countless, I, I would say, but when, when you're looking to become a multi-state operator and really expand past just your own state, certainly your product is staying within each state individually at this point in time. 
but there, there are other ways to get into the other states, and, and it, you know, a lot of it is very brand driven. So, it, you know, it's all well and good and possible, but there's just so much work that goes into it that people should really be aware of. I mean, every single jurisdiction is so different in terms of their regulations, the licensing process, the licensing approvals, uh, whether or not you can go into a new state. Some states have uh, local ownership requirements that only, only locals of that state, residents of that state, can own a license to, whether it's manufacture or cultivate uh, or sell uh, cannabis products. And so you really, really do need to look at every single state as if it was just a whole brand new world, almost starting from scratch. Not quite, but it's pretty similar. So it's, it's a lot of legal due diligence. I think everyone gets really excited about the idea of like, oh, well, we can just, we can just take over the West Coast. But there's, just, there's so much more work that goes into it than that for cannabis because of the inability to move that product. You're not able to scale in the same way that another company would be that is not so regulated. And certainly when we come to packaging and marketing, multiple websites, you know, every it's not just gonna be that one simple company making that one simple product or, or you know, that one list of SKUs that, that people can embrace. You have to look at every single state with a brand new eyes. It's as if you were crossing into international waters, as it were. So it, there's just there's tons and tons and tons that could go into it that really would need to be examined on a case by case basis. Yeah, and I would also say, you know, segment those markets because you've got a lot of markets that are coming out now that are limited license. Uh, it's not a state you can enter. Florida, you're not going to walk in and enter it. Uh, there's companies that are paying $100 million just to become a partner in a Florida-based operation. Uh, so when you start to segment those out, you can look at a Colorado, you can look at California, Oregon, Washington, Michigan. Uh, those are states that are going to be easier to enter those markets. You can get a particular type of license and not be fully uh, integrated. Uh, the cost of entry could be a lot uh, significantly lower, but you're going to find more competition. Um, the reason there's limited license states today is because you look at what happened in Oregon. A lot of licensing had happened in Washington. A lot of licensing happened in Denver. A lot of licensing, it changed the landscape of downtown Denver. Uh, competition in Oregon and Washington drove prices into the dirt. They have an, an oversupply of plant material. States want to control the economics of this so that people, so they actually have a viable business and industry in their states. And that's why you're seeing fewer and fewer licenses issued. Um, so so that you got to understand where you can go, how you can go, what the capital constraints going to be to get there, then figure out how to be compliant. Um, and if you, it, then your other choice is to create a brand that's so powerful that the existing license holders want to support you in their markets, and that's a whole nother process. Absolutely. All right, now we're going to switch over to, um, to research and development before we go to questions. So um, I guess, you know, what are some fruitful opportunities for research and development when it comes to cannabis drinks? Well, I, th I think on the research and development side, you have to really decide how you want to do that. There's companies that are going to support you in research and helping develop a product, but it has to be clear in your head what you want them to develop. Um, the other side is if you're in this space, um, start to think about uh, R&D from an internal perspective. And like our organization, you know, we staff uh, biopharmaceutical chemists, we have analytical chemists, we have um, food scientists. We've, we built our own labs in our facilities so that you can not only uh, manage the R&D process, but also the quality control process. Um, looking at uh, a Lagunitas, any beer company, um, there's 10 tests a day on average for every batch of beer over a 30-day cycle. And it has a high and a low, and if you stay in there, it's a good beer and it can go to market. If it's below or over, they, they'll dispose of it potentially. Um, so think quality long term. Now when you think about development, it's really, uh, from a development perspective, is what are you developing for and who are you developing for? Um, and and I, I use this analogy commonly as a, when I was uh, young, when I was a kid, um, if I had Nikes, I was cool. Right? So that brand, I identify the brand, the brand made me cool. Today's consumers are looking for brands to fit them. So when you look at R&D opportunities, understand the why and who the consumer is, why they want your product, um, and, and then design in that targeted application. Excellent. And then uh, Lauren, what do you see as the biggest opportunity in cannabis beverages from a legal perspective? And I'm going to ask the same for you, Stacey. The biggest opportunity from a legal perspective? Yeah. Oh, geez. Um, 
This is interesting. Well, um, I think from the from the cannabis side of things, I do see a lot of opportunity here in the state of California. This is a huge market. There's millions of people here. It is the largest single market if you know we're talking about the U.S. and I think even if we were to look across the world. Um, so being able to zero in and, and develop a big customer base on a really high quality cannabis drink product here um, in California would be great. I've tried some cannabis drinks and dispensaries and I never have found one that I liked yet um, that was very effective for me that had you know consistent dosing so I would say there's definitely opportunities there but there's also a ton of opportunities in the in the hemp CBD drink realm as long as you are following those uh, what the FDA is looking for and steering clear of the types of things that they don't want to see and if you're doing your own uh, testing quality control to make sure that you are putting a, a safe product on the market I think that's a huge opportunity as well. Great. Stacey. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for, for me, I, I came from before, as Omar said earlier, before I, I came to the cannabis industry, I was working in the craft beer industry. And, and when we're looking at cannabis, we are coming into just an extremely highly, I love saying that, highly regulated industry that that is just very concerned about so many things, some of which, you know, for a reasonable person, maybe we think is maybe even overstepping. But there's just all of these regulations. When we look at craft beer and alcohol in general, there, there are a lot of similar concerns, but they're not nearly as highly regulated. And I think, you know, one of the great reasons that a lot of alcohol purveyors, for example, have gotten um, technically, there's no legal requirement for them to age gate their websites. If you go to their website and it pops up, you know, are you over 21 or enter your birth date? That's not legally required. But you know, early on, you know, a lot of these larger companies got together, sat down, and said, "Hey, we we don't want that level of regulation. We don't want the government coming in and telling us what to do. Let's sit down and come up with some best practices and agree amongst ourselves as an industry to really abide by those." And I think there's a big opportunity for cannabis operators to try and go down that same path. Now, we're, we're starting from a much more regulated position, but to the extent that we can sit down and really agree on like, hey, here's some best practices. Let's make sure that we do this. We can start to earn some of that trust and rapport and maybe, maybe you know, as these regulations shape over time, federal legalization comes around sometime, maybe we can avoid more burdensome regulations by being really, really proactive and just really, really committed to quality and transparency by, by self-policing, as it were. And I think that's, in my mind, that's one of the really big legal opportunities that the industry has. And that's certainly exceptionally true in my mind for beverages because of the approachable form factor that it sits in. Again, you know, for me, it's always about people talk about like, oh, well, it's like drinking a beer. And it's like, well, yes, but no. So, you know, you really need to have that conversation with people so that they know what they're getting and that they can have an enjoyable experience. Because it only takes one bad experience. Then you're probably scared off for, everybody has that one guy who made a brownie, you know, when they were 16 and you're like, oh my gosh. But, you know, we can, we can fix that moving forward, probably. Thank you. I think that's it for our time. And we have time for a few questions. Um, so, I guess we have a question back there. If you would please, oh, I think Lauren's coming to you. I'm so. coming with the mic. I'm not so fast in the shoes, but we got it. <laughs> so earlier in the day, there was some conversation about um, there's only so many dispensaries. So when I think, I'm, I'm from Carlsberg in Denmark. Brewery, okay. Route to market is very important. When you've got two or 300 points of sale, it's pretty limited. So the question I have for the panel is, what is your view on the expansion of, say, these tap, tap rooms, lounges, the expansion of that over the next couple of years. What is your view from the, from the regulatory state here? And let's just make, keep it specific to California because you're both well versed in that. Any I, views on that? Because I think that to me is a huge, huge ultimate opportunity. I think there's a lot of momentum for consumption lounges. You're, you're seeing the regulations looking that direction and, and starting to build uh, you know, some allowances. And, and I think that it, it's one of those, it kind of goes back to that self-policing. I think people are really nervous about people consuming out in the big wide world and then having to drive home for some reason. But we have those same concerns in other places. People go to bars and drink all the time, and they find a way to make it home in a safe manner. So we just we need an opportunity to slowly and really respectfully build that rapport. But there is momentum for, for those consumption lounges. And I think that they'll be hugely popular with the caveat that if 
that if you know it again, if it's only that one big bad experience, and then everyone will swoop in and put a big kibosh, and, and then and then you don't know how far back you might be set. And, and and that's not necessarily even an operator. That could be just one kind of silly consumer who wasn't thinking right and maybe overdid it a little bit, and that's going to affect the entire industry. But there there's definitely that momentum. I think legally, there's a lot of enthusiasm about it, even at a regulatory perspective. They 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 know it. It's a form factor they've seen before. And it's just a matter of slowly earning that respect. And if I can just jump in, the issue right now in California is that consumption lounges, cannabis consumption lounges, have to be part of a dispensary. That's the way it's written in the BCC regs right now. So you see a few cities, Palm Springs, West Hollywood, trying to issue their own consumption lounge cafe licenses. The problem is that doesn't exist at the state level yet. So we need to talk with the BCC and have them create a new license type whereby you don't have to be a dispensary to offer a consumption lounge space. I was just talking at the NCIA conference yesterday. I moderate, moderated a panel on consumption lounges and I took a look at how different places Denver the state of Colorado the city of San Francisco how different places are approaching this issue um, and I I would agree with you the problem right now in California for those of you who aren't aware um, it's a uh, we have local control here so in order to get a state license you first need to get a local permit from your city or county and there are a lot of folks throughout the state who don't like the idea of dispensaries they don't want them in their backyard and so there are very few places throughout the state mostly in cities where you can even get a dispensary license. There's huge, you know, cannabis deserts, we'll call them, throughout most of the state where there won't be any dispensaries. There might be one licensed delivery service and you might have to go for a while to get it. So it's a combination of putting pressure on local jurisdictions to start issuing more dispensary licenses, either storefront or delivery or both, as well as creating, putting pressure on the BCC to create a separate license type that's just for a consumption lounge where people can come and bring their own. You don't necessarily have to sell it to them or a lounge that could you know, do some sales there, but not necessarily having it be tied to a dispensary because some cities and counties won't like the idea of a dispensary. That's never going to add more. So it's really like a two-pronged approach that we've got to take, and we would love it if you know if alcohol companies could help us with this fight, and the rest of you in this room could help us with this fight because we need all the momentum we can get. And it goes down to a really simple. And you know, if if Mike wants to take two routes to a consumption lounge. So, so say all of the stars align and there's a consumption lounge, there's a dispensary on site, they have a consumption lounge, they want to sell your products. And Mike wants to take two routes and, and I want to bring hi-fi hops. We can't bring kegs because the packaging regulations haven't gotten around to the idea of a large format service. So every single one of those purchases is going to have to be an individualized bottle or can as the case may be. And you know that's not very environmentally friendly, but it's also not very dispensary friendly. Those take up a lot of space. You know the dispensaries right now don't even have fridges a lot of the time. You know, so we're trying to work with them on, on the ability to have in-store fridges. Try delivering a pallet to a door that is not sized for pallets. Um, you, we really it needs to go so much further in terms of the practicalities of it as well. So when we think about lobbying for those kinds of you know, improvements, we really need to think all the way back the supply chain <laughs> to make sure that we can put it in the right kind of packaging for that sort of service and that form factor mm -hmm. and, and that those places have the right kinds of uh, capacities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're, what we're seeing today in, in uh, the interest from lounges is actually really high. Um, not, no pun intended, but, um, <laughs> you know, but there's, a, there's a whole business model challenge, eh? Um, then it's, in, in the state of California, it is a local legislation issue. Uh, the state says you can do it, but the city says you can't. Um, but when we look in San Francisco, we're, we're actually working with a couple lounges now in that market. Um, and the best thing that's coming out of that is actually the insight uh, that I think can be the foundation for lobbying. Uh, because I was on a call with, uh, with Mo Greens up in San Francisco, in San Francisco just last week. I had a really interesting conversation and my sales team had let me know that they thought Mo wanted, uh, Mo Greens wanted a higher dose uh, uh, drink and we make a five milligram drink. And so at the end of the call I say, hey look, I understand you want more, more milligrams. If that's something you want, we're happy to do it for you. He goes, no, 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 could you cut it in half? Um, and, and the reason being is that um, there are newcomers to cannabis and they go in a store and they buy something, an edible. Um, they, they don't have the experience, you know, they don't know what to expect. They go into the lounge and they eat it and then they have a bad day. They could get sick, they could fall asleep um, and the, the lounge owners own this. How do I deal with it? But when the product is actually formulated right in the right form factor um, and the consumer can, can drink it, uh, get the bell curve of alcohol, right? Uh, they can self-regulate. Now, now we're creating the argument that if we can get a standard, 
right? That two and a half milligrams, two milligrams. Now it is equivalent to a beer mm. with the right onset and offset that we can actually lobby for change. And because lobbying for change in an edible environment today where you know, two hours later it hits you, that's dangerous, and if I was a legislator, I would have a lot of concern about dispensing or selling or allowing someone to consume a product in a social environment that had n no guarantee for when it was gonna hit you and where you were when it hit you. And it's funny, the last time I had an edible, I, I'm not a consumer, but I, I had an edible, and then two hours after dinner, I hadn't felt anything. And then I was driving home, and I started to feel things. And I was like, holy moly, that's a dangerous environment. So, you know, the, the technology, right, to get rapid onset and dissipation, uh, to um, get consumers to, ex to want lower doses so that it's more sessionable and it's not about getting high, but actually experience, the experience of consumption, the social aspects of, of engaging, just like we do today with an alcoholic beverage, that's where the lounges are gonna be so, so beneficial is, is in lobbying. We have a question over here. Uh, specifically regarding uh, CBD, do you see as more states legalize marijuana in general that this will go down the route of the alcohol world where it's more of a state's rights issue as far as regulation goes or will it be more of a FDA regulated the way a traditional non-alcoholic beverage would be nutrition versus supplement facts, grass ingredients, et cetera? I mean, I, I think it'll go more, more the way of alcohol. I mean, the, so the FDA approved, so the, hemp, the farm bill came through for hemp with regards to the FDA, still working on the USDA, that's a separate issue entirely. The, but even then, each state gets to come up with its own version. As long as it's close enough to what the feds are gonna come up with, they're gonna be okay with that. And so at the end of the day, every single state's gonna have a slightly different regime. And, and, and why would they ever want to let go of that revenue? If there's any way to keep a claw into that regime and be able to tax it, I feel like they're going to hold on to it with every last ounce they have. So, I mean, anything could happen. It's a brave new world out there, but my, my thought is that it'll, it'll stay pretty state-specific and state-oriented, even, even at the hemp side. Uh, yeah. I, th I think uh, when, you know, CBDs go in FDA, right? But if we look, take a look at who's coming into THC, um, it's big alcohol today. They're ahead of they're ahead of pharma. They're you know, they're ahead of the tobacco industry. Uh, they have significant lobbying resources and and budgets against that. Um, and they they know where they're going to want to steer THC uh, because they're investing in it, right? So I think understanding who's coming in the industry and how aggressively they're coming in is really going to dictate uh, where certain things are going to land simply from that influence. We have a question over here. Hi there, this is Deborah Johnson with the Arcview Group, and thank you so much for your wonderful panel. I am learning so much. And you know, we just had our conference last week in Chicago, and we were very much talking about the SOPs, sort of standards of practice, along with language. And one of the things that's been really enlightening to me this week has been the lack of language or terms, like we're like beverage or, you know. So my question is, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about the development of that language, who might take a hold of you know making a consensus within this industry, at least across the U.S. in terms of what language, what these standards are. Do you see like some kind of entity or something being able to move into that to help us all come together on this? What do you say, Omar? Is Inpa going to take up the uh, take up the banner? <laughs> well, I think uh, there will be like a trade association that mm -hmm. will try to uh, set up standards and you know. Absolutely. Um, if it doesn't happen, it's going to be outside regulation from government officials. So clearly, the enlightened self-interest is in the way of self-regulation. Right. But then that's, you know, when we're talking about having to not market something as beer or wine, you've got to get creative. You've got to almost come up with a new term to call these things that we can identify it by. So. State by state. State by state. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, it's, right now it's really a race. Right, so everybody's got blinders on. They're not thinking about uh, cooperation. They're not thinking about trade trade groups, um, and so everybody's very, very, very blinded on getting to the points that they want to get to. That creates a, a lot of separation. Um, additionally, there's market advantage uh, that those who have a position have a technology. Do they want to share it? Uh, do they want 
the, that they become a standard or do they want to stay isolated? They want to stay where they are for as long as they can so as to take advantage of that position, that technology, whatnot. And we're going to have to move through that phase of this uh, burgeoning uh, category in the cannabis industry before things start to stabilize and alignments can be formed and uh, mutual objectives agreed upon and standards that would fall flow from that. Yeah, it's, it's funny, you said sessionable a second ago, and I was like, hmm, I wonder if they would let, that, let us put that on one of our products. I mean, that's such a, it's not a beer word inherently, but it's so frequently used, yeah. and, and, and I, I mean, I think I mostly hear it in terms of, of beers. Oh, beer, yeah. Would you be able to use sessionable? It's an excellent question. But I think it goes, you know, so deeply into the industry because, you know, it, health claims, for example, you know, the, I feel like I harp on health claims all the time, but it, it's just, it's a really important topic. And people still say medicated this or medicated that so frequently. And I'm like, no, 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 we need to switch to infuse. We, it's not medicated. It's not medical yet, probably, depending on where you are and what your license yeah, and is. And versus dosed. Dosed. Yeah, another infused. one. Yes. Yeah. So it, it, dose it, sounds very scary. The very yeah. smallest yeah. level of language really needs to be very closely examined. And, and absolutely, it, it's so variable right now. But I think... I think the industry is going to have to take some time to figure out who, who the big players are, and then those, those players will eventually come together and, and decide on some best practices, because it's in everyone's best interest to come up with a vernacular that people can access. Um, but right now, it's all about differentiation and speed to market, so you have some competing interests there. You know, we, 10 years ago, we didn't have this whole vape pen uh, product line, and you know, we didn't know that that was going to be one of the you know, main product categories for cannabis. So um, there's probably somebody in this room who's going to invent a new product offering and a totally new product that we don't even know we needed until we saw it. We have two more questions. We're going to go here and then here to the front. Well, thank you again for, for your time and your insight. Um, as, as, an, as an entrepreneur who's in the early stages of developing a hemp CBD product, um, how should we be thinking about current uh, logistics and shipping around uh, as we're building a direct-to-consumer brand, uh, both today and in the immediate future as that continues to evolve? Well, um, you can start by making sure you read all of the FDA guidance, the USPTO, so the post office has some guidance recently about um, shipping this stuff. Um, just gather as much information as you can. It's a bit of a confusing space, um, but you need to have all of that knowledge under your belt if you're going to start this company. So um, speak with legal counsel as well um, in potentially each state that you're considering selling your product in because there are going to be differences um, state to state that you're going to have to be aware of. So that would be my advice. And be ready for unanswerable questions. It's, it's a horrible thing to say, especially as an attorney. You never want to say there are unanswerable questions. But, and this is true in so many ways, but you're gonna come up with a thing where, you know, Mike said earlier, one set of regulations says this, and it was designed for cannabis, or it was designed for hemp, and so we wanna go with what this says. But there's this other regulation that by the letter of its writing applies, and it says something completely different, and there's no way to truly, simply, just make the two work in tandem. And you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And so you have to be really creative, you have to be really adaptable, and you know, really willing to work with, with legal counsel and you know, with regulators, as the case may be. But it's one of those things that, if you're not ready for some really tricky questions, it's gonna be a rough road ahead. It, it's doable. There's lots of companies out there doing a great job of it. And I think it comes down to adaptability in so many instances of, of saying, sometimes there's not a great answer, but we're gonna, we're gonna find the best answer we can find and move forward with that. Yeah, yeah, identify your, uh, your, your comfort level with risk. And it should be high. <laughs> and that question in the front was actually the same question. Yeah. So that will conclude the formal portion, but everyone will still be in the back for a moment if we have individual questions. Thank you so much to our panel. Thank you for coming. <laughs>